our final paper for the morning, saving the best for last. Dr. Cameron McNeil, who is from the City University of New York and uh, Lehman College, um, worked with us at Copan for a number of years and still is working in Copan. The title of her paper is Using Pollen Analysis to Recover the Patterns of Ancient Land Management at Copan, Honduras. Please welcome Dr. Cameron McNeil. All right, I'm going to talk to you today about um, work I did at Copan. Um, I was uh, working on um, Dr. Sheriff's project for uh, quite a number of years. Um, and I used pollen in two ways. I looked at, um, I looked at both ritual samples and uh, samples from um, sediment cores in the area. And um, these are two different bodies of information, but they're to some degree complementary. And for those of you who you know, don't know uh, Copan, um, this is what Copan would have looked like during the late classic period. This is a reconstruction that was appeared in National Geographic. And um, Copan is located um, down here on the southeastern periphery in Honduras, um, quite a ways away from um, the Batan sites, um, college schools you call Palenque, for example. Oh, well, Palenque is not the Batan, but um, from uh, Calhoun and um, Cal. And um, there were several projects at Copan, including that of um, Dr. Cher, that um, excavated a series of tunnels into the Acropolis. And um, Bob asked me to come down and take samples from um, floors um, of buildings that they had excavated, and I took samples from 40 floors, to try and determine what kind of plants were in, on those structures, um, if any um, remains um, could be found. And I had a good bit of luck. Um, I took thousands of samples. And I think here's a picture of me taking a sample. Um, I took thousands of samples. Maybe 5% um, had good, uh, good information in them. Um, but it was a wonderful opportunity because these are buildings that were intentionally buried by the Maya. The sample, you could take a pristine sample from the floor, um, like you can see here. And, uh, and some of these floors had a substantial amount of organic material on them. The two best places for sampling were um, a temple called Rosalila, which you saw in Katie's talk, and a tomb that was excavated by um, uh, the University of Pennsylvania Museum's project, directed by Bob, um, called Margarita. And I found that um, there were four plants or species that um, were found again and again on the temple floors. I'm looking for more buried floors, so if anyone out there finds some intentionally buried floors, I, I would like to sample a lot more or, or, or tombs. Um, I would like to see whether the same types of plants were being used at, um, at all sites or whether some of these plants were particular to Copan. So I found that um, cattails were being used, and that's not surprising because for the Maya, the place of origins was the place of the cattails. So they were essentially recreating these places of origin in their ritual spaces. Um, I found that um, quail um, palms were being um, used and maize was being used and um, also um, this fragrant flower called Beraria awanita. <laughs> There's, uh, as I'm sure you know if you study the Maya, um, a lot of debates about what happened to these um, southern lowland polities um, between the uh, 9th and 10th centuries, some, sometimes even a bit earlier. Um, Many of the centers were abandoned. They suffered political and demographic um, decreases, well, political um, uh, destabilization and, and significant demographic decreases. And uh, this is what Copan looked like when the uh, when um, Stevens and Catherwood arrived at the site. And to begin with, I just want to talk about a little bit about what. Um, what the timeline is at Copan, um, but I am going to discuss um, one of the proposals for one of the prime movers behind the collapse of Copan was environmental mismanagement. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what my own um, evidence has been. And the reason, I, I, when I first went to Copan to work on Bob's project, I had no intention of looking at environmental issues at Copan. But when I started to find pollen on all these ritual floors, the, the professor with whom I was working, um, David Burney, who's a paleoecologist, he said, oh, well now you have to find out what the environment looks like, because really it's extremely hard to interpret what kind of pollen is being used in ritual spaces if you don't understand what the environmental context was of that use. 
So here I thought, oh wow, I'm doing great. I'll be able to finish my dissertation soon. And then he's like, oh no, no, no. Now you have to start a whole new thing. And my dissertation became like two separate projects. One ritual plant use, one environmental, the environmental context. When I went to Kokan, I thought, well, we pretty much know what the environmental situation is in Kokan because there had been a lot of work done in the 1980s. And, um, and, and particularly in a project called Pac-2, and what that project had determined was that when the Maya came in, the early classic, you know, I guess the environment was basically fine, there were probably lots of trees. And then um, as the as the Copan polity um, grew and as the chiefdom turned into a state and the population expanded and expanded, um, they cut down more and more trees in an effort to create clear arable land to feed the population. And they were also building on the valley floor. And so they were using up some of their best arable land and running out of land. And as they did that, it was theorized they would be moving up into the hills. And because of heavy rains, um, those soils, once they were cleared, would be you know, moving off um, in erosion layers and covering some of the really good soils down below. And they would take, cut down more trees and more trees and more trees. And um, that project had theorized that by about AD 800, there would be no pine trees left. Um, which is certainly economically the most important tree for the Maya. They use pine for uh, ritual spaces, it's the predominant wood, but also for firewood and to start fires. And in fact, in some polities such as Shinantanish, um, uh, David Lentz, who's an archaeobotanist, has found that they were importing pine um, into the center of the polity for, so that they would have it to burn, even though there's no pine um, in the immediate area of Shinantanish. So pine was extremely valued by them. And if there were no pine trees left in Copan by AD, AD, AD um, 800, they were going to be in trouble, right? Not to mention other, other trees. And pine and oak are the predominant woods found in Copan Valley today. You only get tropical forest on the low, um, the low fields along the river. Um, the hills are primarily covered with um, pine and oak. So but the Maya would really have a wood shortage if they didn't have any pine. Um, okay. so, Copan timeline. Um, the pre-classic um, period, uh, we're talking here, it's about 1250 um, BC to AD 100. Um, you have a population in the valley that is not generally believed to be um, predominantly Maya. Um, they're a Lenca population and possibly Lenca. Um, the Lenca today have are, are, are along the border between uh, Guadal between Honduras and El Salvador and a little bit of Guatemala. But it's, they have a distinctively different settlement pattern from the, um, from the Maya settlement pattern. The first Maya immigrants, um, based on settlement studies, um, were believed to move into the valley around AD um, 100, um, continually coming in until about until 400 and, and after. The early classic period at Copan, not at all Maya sites, is roughly AD 400 to 600. Um, that's sometimes marked by the arrival of Pini Chashkogmo, who you just learned about in the last talk. And he was um, the founder of the classic period Maya dynasty, and I'm sorry, that should say 83, 427. He is um, made king elsewhere, and he arrives in 8427. Uh, we don't really know um, the particulars of that. Um, and the late classic is roughly 8600 to 900. The last inscription at the site is found on altar L, and, um, and that corresponds to AD 822. People may have lived in the city past that date. There's some debate as to how long they would have lived there and whether there was a complete break, because there is a limited post-classic occupation as well. And the post-classic um, is any time from um, AD 900 until the Spanish arrival in the 16th century. There have also been some debates about how rapid the collapse was at Copan. Um, the Pac-2 project proposed that it was a very slow demographic decrease other projects have believed that it, it was uh, that the city was rapidly abandoned, and indeed, uh, work by Bill Fash and uh, Will Andrews and Cam Manahan has proposed that the city was um, was sacked. It was burned. Um, someone destroyed uh, some people. Someone destroyed um, uh, buildings in the center of the polity, in or sometime between 800 and 900 AD. 
To understand something about um, what the environmental history is at Copan, you need to understand how the Maya um, practice agriculture. And we now know that the Maya practice agriculture in, in many different ways, um, sustainable ways, with terraces, as you'll learn um, in a talk later today, by the chases, um, using Bajo, sed Bajo sediments. Um, but the basic form of, of Maya agriculture is believed to be Sweden agriculture because in tropical environments you have issues with soil fertility. And what the Maya do is they use an area of land, uh, they, they take an area of land that's forested, they cut down the forest, burn them, turn them into the soil, and they use that area of land for possibly three to five years, depending on how much, uh, what the quality, what the level of fertility is that they've been able to turn into the soil. And then they let it go fallow. And letting go fallow doesn't mean that they don't use it at all. They tend to selectively create forest gardens, and they can continue to um, produce a lot of um, various household foods from that area, fruits and things like avocados. You know, the Maya consumed avocados. We found avocados in garbage pits at the site. And many different kinds of um, palm fruits. Um, they can get oil from palm. They can eat. Uh, they, they, they drank the sap of the palm. And um, nanse, for example, um, which is a small yellow fruit that's consumed. That, that process creates this managed mosaic when you look at a Maya environment of forested areas and open spaces. Um, to go back a bit to um, this idea of deforestation, um, today deforestation is a major problem in Copan. This is what um, an area looked like above a laguna that I was pouring. Um, I watched people take a chainsaw and just cut down one tree after another tree after another tree. One day while we were down below, it's illegal, but no one stops it. A lot of this wood is being exported um, to other countries because that is um, uh, an important economic good that comes from Honduras. Uh, it's not surprising that um, this idea of deforestation would um, become a popular theory for uh, as one of the one of the causes of Maya collapse. The project that worked at Copan, uh, the Pac-2 project, said that the preponderance of evidence points to a forest a forest management as a factor contributing to systematic failure at Copan. And this idea has been picked up by Jared Diamond. I think Jared Diamond has written two or three articles on Copan. And he uses it in his talks about, um, about deforestation. And what he's basically saying is, you know, look at what the Maya did. If we don't rein in our abuses of the environment today, then we're going to be in trouble just like they were. Although, as I'm going to discuss today, I don't think that we can accuse the uh, classic period Maya of being guilty of um, horrific environmental mismanagement. And I don't think that, that was one of the primary causes of the collapse. But Jared Diamond wrote, why didn't the leaders of the Maya recognize and solve their problems? And what were the Maya thinking while well, they watched loggers clearing the last pine forests on the hills above Copan? And you know, indeed, they would be very irresponsible leaders if they had cleared the last of the pine forests from, um, from the Copan pocket. So um, I took sediment cores from uh, five bodies of water in the valley. Three of these are um, useful for my research. Um, two of them were not. And this is an ongoing project, so I'm only going to talk about the analysis of one core today. One core is not going to provide us a picture on the entire Copan Valley. We need more. Unfortunately, there, there are only two more that are good from Copan. Uh, I'll show you pictures of those at the end of this talk. And here's a picture of us, um, my team and myself, um, Rigo Berto Morales and Abdulia Garza um, and myself, um, taking a sediment core uh, with a piston core. And here's what a sediment core looks like. Um, this is from the core that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is um, pre-classic sediments. These are classic sediments. Um, this is compact plant material. I've tried to think about how ancient lagunas looked to the Maya. There's a huge debate. Are they clean? Are they full of vegetation? Um, everyone at Copan has said to me, oh, we should clean up that laguna and make it look just like it looked during Maya time. Except I'm not sure that they were. Um, Clear to vegetation. There are a lot of useful plants and, and animals that live in the vegetation of lagunas. And if the Maya were um, optimizing the food they could get from these areas, they may not have wanted to clean them out. And that's sort of been a debate for myself. I initially thought that because there's so much compact plant vegetation, that these areas were covered in vegetation. I've since wondered whether they're covered in vegetation because they were cutting the vegetation down and it would fall into the bottom. Um, because in the post-classic period, it's 
the, veg the, the sediments are clay and they are no longer this dense vegetation. So this is somehow, somehow symptomatic of human processes in this body of water. These areas right here I'm going to talk about, um, these are erosion layers. These are pretty small erosion layers, but you can see the stratigraphy in them. Um, these are uh, th these represent instances where sediment has come off the hillside rapidly um, into the body of water, and they have very low amounts of pollen because um, the pollen did not approve slowly. Um, this just washed in um, in um, you know many events, possibly through the hurricanes or torrential rains. And I'm going to talk about this layer, which is very important to my analysis, which is actually a volcanic <coughs> ash layer um, that is um, glass. And when the core dried out, it became this white, puffy layer in the core. All right. Um, so I assume you all know what pollen is. Um, here's some lovely pollen grains. Um, pollen grains um, produce and hold the male gametes, which are found on the anthers of flowers. And they're wonderful for analysis because they can um, generally be reduced to genus, but often even to species, um, which is extremely useful. And here are some of the grains that I found in the sediment core of Ketapia. Um, this is a palm grain from Hymadoria. This is uh, oak, Farcus, and this is pine, the most common um, type of pollen that you find in the sediment core um, from our royal species. And when we're looking at pollen cores, we're interested in comparing the amount of species that represent open spaces to the amount of species representing closed spaces. So, you know, forested spaces versus fields. And um, so we're also interested in the um, upland herbs um, in the core. And um, this is a type of um, daisy pollen, not this species, but that was a good picture of um, a plant from the daisy family. Um, this is a, a maize grain, actually not my picture, because maize is, is so easy to identify that I don't generally take photographs of it. Um, I'm sorry, grass. Grass is so easy to identify that I don't take photos of just a normal grass grain. And uh, this is a maize pollen grain. Um, it's hard to get a good picture of maize because the grains are so large that when you find them in sediment core, they usually collapse um, to some degree. So this is maize right here, which is also a type of grass. The only type of um, the type only type of grass pollen that I um, separately count. And here is a sediment core. And I'll explain to you a little bit about how to look at this. Um, across the top here, these are all the species that I found. And um, basically what you're most interested in here is um, the ratio represented in this area between um, upland herb pollen represented by the black bars and essentially the white space, which is um, the, uh, the amount of um, arboreal pollen. So in the places where the black bars are highest, that's where there is the most open space in the valley. Now, there could naturally be open space, right? Or the open space could be a result of um, a burning. So if you just simply saw a core with no evidence of burning, but you had a high amount of open space, then it might have naturally been savanna. But if you have with it a high amount of burning, then um, that's probably a cause, especially over a long period of time, of human, um, of intentional burning by humans. Um, the core dates to um, 900 to 790 Cal year BC, so about, it's about 3,000 years old. So it gives us a, about 3,000 year history. And if you look at this earliest period, this is the pre-classic. That is when we find the highest level of deforestation in Copan. These aren't the, when people have looked at Copan today, and we can see that there are erosion layers, and we can also see that there, is not, there are not old soils on the hillside. We didn't think that it was the pre-classic population that were the culprits. <laughs> but the Maya were blamed for this. The classic period population was blamed for this. But in fact, when the Maya came into the valley, the damage was done. A lot of the damage was already done. Um, and uh, it's interesting to think that people today in Copan are still living with decisions made by people who, um, who were in the valley 3,000. This is not actually a surprising pattern. This is the pattern that we're beginning to see all over Mesoamerica. That 3,000 to about 4,500 years ago, when people were first beginning to embrace agriculture on a wide scale, they didn't understand the limits of their environment. They didn't understand how to um, practice agriculture successfully. And they deforested huge swaths of land. So very excited about their new toy, and they just didn't know how to play with it. 
All right. Um, from this very, from these very earliest levels, um, I find maize pollen in the core, um, and maize pollen it doesn't travel very far from the field, about 40 feet uh, in general. <laughs> so I assume that during the periods that I found maize pollen, there were maize fields around Petapia. It's not always there. I mean, there are plenty of levels that don't have maize pollen. Um, again, because it, it isn't a pollen that you're ever going to find it a lot of in a core. I find one to three grains generally per level um, because it doesn't travel far. And in these earliest levels, not surprisingly, there is a massive amount of charcoal. So yes, the clearance found in the earliest levels of Petapia is a product of human action. They're burning all around this um, level. It's, 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 it's astounding how much, um, how much they were burning the landscape. And also not surprising, following this period um, of, of deforestation and burning, um, there, is, there are many levels where I cannot guess statistical significance because when it was raining, um, soil was pouring off the hillside into the body of water. So the highest amount of erosion is found um, in the pre-classic following this, um, this initial deforestation of the valley. And basically, if, if I can't get statistical significance, I don't include the bar in the core. So I counted um, almost every level in the core. But these are areas where I could have counted to my heart's content. I could never get statistical significance, which for us, um, is 200 arboreal grains per level. So if I counted the entire sample, I could not get 200 arboreal grains. There was at least one level that had one pollen grain in it. Um, that's representative of severe, severe erosion. Um, all right, the second period of deforestation, um, of the ho second highest peak of deforestation at the site um, begins here, um, which, which is, so, which is either in the late pre-classic or the early classic. I'm going to guess it's in the early classic, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And at this point, um, the highest level is 65.3% um, um, of the special assemblage is made up of, um, of pollen-indicating open spaces. That's substantially less than was found in the pre-classic period, the early pre-classic. And that period, you can see uh, marked here by this red bar. I'm not sure how much. Can you guys see the grade bar there? All right, um, and also interestingly at the same time, um, around that same time we see um, coil pollen. Um, it starts, um, so that level's right here, the coil pollen begins right about here. And um, coil is an interesting marker in the, in the core because we know that um, we don't find coil fragments, um, the, the shell fragments. This is a palm where you can eat the fruit. We don't find the um, endocarp fragments in the garbage bins of sites until the Aki Bihak transition, which is the transition between the pre-classic and the um, classic period, which I assume would be a bit later than this. But we don't even find the plant occurring in the core until, um, until right here. And this is a palm that is extremely important to the Copan Maya. Um, I also found it on uh, ritual floors. So it's something they're using in their temples and in their tombs um, as an adornment. And, to, and it's an and you can eat um, many different parts of this plant, so the heart, the sap, the young inflorescence, and the net of this palm are all edible. And we may have a vessel from um, Dr. Sharon's project that contained um, uh, palm sap, but it's something we need to do more analysis on. Um, but we found a vessel that was full of palm um, vitalis. Um, and fermented beverage of this sap was made until about 20 years ago. Um, my accounts of this sap say that if you can ferment it, and it ferments within a day to three days, and um, they say that you can drink it, and you get sober, and then from the, from the previous drink, you get drunk again. Um, <laughs> and it was used as a ritual beverage in many places. So about 20 years ago, it was the primary alcoholic beverage in Copenhagen. All right, so how do I know roughly when these things are happening? Well, um, because I have this wonderful marker in the core um, that basically um, marks, I believe, the um, early classic in the sediment core. Paleoecologists are usually limited to AMS dates. And for the Copan area, we get a 200-year span on those dates. And that's, that, that limits your ability to line up events in the sediment core to, um, to <laughs> Uh, lithic dates because um, 
It could happen any time in a 200-year span. You just you don't know. And when you consider that the late classic at Copan is only 400 years, that's 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 um, not very useful. Um, but in Petapia, there there was a gift for me, and that was the volcanic ash layer. This is what it looks like um, under a microscope. It looks like shards of broken glass. And it happens um, just um, just above, so just after that highest peak in deforestation. And what's also wonderful about it is that, it, that this ash layer is found in many other areas, sometimes um, substantially more of it. Uh, for example, in El Salvador, um, this is from um, San Andreas, and this layer is the same as this layer. What that tells us is that whatever happened after this is also environmentally whatever is happening after this, right? You can line up environmental um, practices at the exact same time in the levels that are immediately above um, this ash layer in certain places and in the levels that are immediately below. So in the future, as more and more sediment cores are looked at that have this ash layer, we'll get a better idea um, for, what, for exactly what is happening throughout the um, southern Maya area where this um, ash layer fell, or fell at least to an extent that we can identify it. And work by Robert Dull has determined that this eruption um, so it's an eruption from um, the volcano Ilopango that it most likely centered uh, between AD 420 and 430. I actually took a sample of this ash and I sent it to um, Andre Sonia Wojcicki at the USGS and he chemically um, matched it to Ilopango. So we know for certain that it is the Ilopango eruption. And from work from Robert Dull, we know that it happened around AD 420 to 430, which is amazing because that's much better than the 200 year span that I had on the Tefra initially. And we also know that Kimichash Kukmo, well, from inscriptions, arrived in Copan around AD 427. Um, so he arrived sometime close to this eruption. If we're to believe Alter Q, um, there are some earlier, uh, some other dates that um, contradict this. Um, and um, here is um, the Hunal, uh, Kimichash Kukmo and the Hunal tomb. Um, and here is a representation of, um, of this king from Copan that was found outside of Boulder 12. So um, what does that mean exactly? Um, what would that have, have meant to his reign? Um, well, uh, here is the eruption. Here is Copan. Payson Sheets has suggested that, um, that this could have been a boon for Copan because it shut off um, much of El Salvador for about 100 years. So it would have put trade goods um, that had to now bypass El Salvador from lower Central America going through Copan. Um, Payson Chiefs has also suggested that it could have been um, useful for soil fertility because you've had all these um, minerals coming from the ash that are related to the fields and indeed in the short term that could have been um, quite beneficial um, to these um, early, uh, to these, this new Maya dynasty. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back one more minute. I, mean, I want to say one more thing about this. Um, one of the questions for me was, uh, was Ilopango, um, did Yashkukmo arrive because of Ilopango? Was El Salvador shut off and, and, and did the Maya then say, wow, let's, let's go take this site? Um, unfortunately, because that highest level happens right before um, the eruption and not after, I don't think that environmentally that, that suggests that, although possibly the um, high level of deforestation is not related to Kenny Yashkukmo. However, when he arrived, um, there was more construction that occurred in the 75 years immediately following his arrival than, um, than in the 300 years um, remaining in the, in the history of the polity. So, um, and he initiated this huge um, plant building plan that happened, and that would have required a lot of stack up. So um, that, that certainly would be a possible potential impetus behind this deforestation that happened um, uh, in the, you know, late classic, early classic. So. Okay. All right, um, one of the big questions behind the history of Copan is did the Maya destroy um, their environment? Um, was the area heavily deforested? Of course it was deforested. I mean, of course, I wouldn't expect a Maya polity to look the same as um, an area where no people were living. So yes, they were deforesting it. But were they using their environment in a sustainable way or were they destroying it? Um, when we look at uh, classic period iconography, um, late classic period iconography, it's full arboreal imagery. 
And we know that the Maya recreated the natural world in their polities. Uh, the pyramidal platforms represented mountains, the plazas represented primordial seas, and we're all, with, all the, with all the arboreal iconography simply wishful thinking, were they recreating the trees because they didn't have the trees in their landscape anymore? Or were, was all of this arboreal iconography also a genuine representation of the way the Maya treated their environment sustainably um, and, uh, and, and simply a complement to what they had there naturally? Well, um, the late classic period, surprisingly, is um, significantly less deforested than the early classic period. So my answer would be yes, that the Maya are managing their environment. Again, this is only one sediment core. Um, obviously, we want the results from more than one sediment core. But, um, but it's incredible how even the ratio is between uh, op plants representing open spaces and, um, and plants representing coerced spaces, and significantly less deforested than in this sort of, in this area um, representing the early classic. And why is that? I mean, how could the Maya be staving off environmental destruction um, and providing enough food for their population with, um, with the limited um, arable land that they had? And I think that it's probably because, and certainly other people have suggested this for different reasons, because they were reaching out and using some of these other areas in the Copan Valley to produce food for the Polity Center, um, particularly Rio Amarillo um, West and Rio Amarillo East, which are the wettest parts of the valley as well. And never had a large population either, um, have low settlement density. And work by Cassandra Bill and um, Kazuo Ayoyama has found that um, trade goods are being brought from Copan Center out into Rio Amarillo, but there's, there's no clear product that is coming from Rio Amarillo into the Copan Center. And um, so I would suggest that that was probably food. Um, so there's um, different types of um, ceramics which we know are produced in the Copan Valley. They're going out. Obsidian blades also arriving in, in Rio Amarillo. And um, then the polity um, collapsed um, politically, and there was a dramatic demographic decrease. It's fairly rapid, despite earlier proposals that it would be a slow demographic collapse. So it, there's a decrease here where um, the forests begin to return, and then it's fairly dramatic in this period. Um, there's very low levels of population in the valley. Um, certainly there may still be people there, but there aren't many people there. They aren't leaving a significant mark on the landscape. There is one level um, around AD 1200 um, where, uh, where there's maize, and that's the last level that I find maize until the present, present time in the core. We know that the last date at the site is AD 822, although Rio Amarillo might have a slightly later date. It might have a date of AD 910 um, on an altar. <coughs> Um, the last altar at the site is Altar L, which is extremely crudely produced. It's my favorite altar because it's really badly made. And if you compare it with other altars, it's just, it's so sad. And, it, and, and the sides aren't finished and the inscriptions aren't there. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, the inscriptions on the sides and the cartouches aren't there. So, it, you know, it's quite wonderful. Um, not, not what it represents because it's, it's a sad thing, but um, the fact that it was actually placed there. Um, uh, is a, is a, is a, shows that Utsutak was doing his best. Okay. Um, a lot of people have suggested that drought uh, may be one of the causes of the collapse, and this is something I'm still looking into. There are some suggestions in the core of a drought, um, and this would be um, the best indication right here. This is uh, the level which is concomitant with um, the, um, which, concomitant with, with, what, with what appears to be a demographic decrease in the core. And you can see there's an amazing amount of pollen, and this is type of pollen in this level. And um, this would imply that typha, uh, which is a plant that usually is largely found on the margins of the body of water, has moved into the deepest um, area of the water. Typha can actually pull itself along by its roots. And what's really important is knowing which kind of typha that is. So um, the pollen in that area is the, a grain which is called a tetrad, four grains together. At least 20% of the pollen in, um, in, this, in, that, um, in that level at the end of the classic is, um, 
is typholatifolia or a typholatifolia domingensis cross. Typholatifolia is always represented with this tetra by grain. Domingensis is represented by a monad grain. If it's a cross between the two, it can express both traits. And the reason that's important is because typholatifolia is a shallow water cattail. You don't usually find it in, in, in water deeper than 20 centimeters, but, lot of, but dolmengensis can go much deeper. And, um, and latifolia will not produce flowers in water deeper than five centimeters, while latifolia type, type of dolmengensis cross can produce flower at, at greater depths, but it also tends to focus its flower production in shallower areas. And this summer, we're gonna try and do some DNA work, um, hopefully with, um, with these pollen grains. It's gonna be really hard. Uh, I have to somehow pick these pollen grains out of the sample and get a sample that only has the type of pollen, but we're gonna try to um, do some DNA work to see if it is latifolia, um, which would make it a much better indication of drought. There are a couple other um, drought indicators in the valley. Uh, this core was cored by David, this lignin was cored by David Rue before, and he, um, he got a core that hit hard clay sediments at 1000 AD. And, and when you hit hard clay with sediments like that, you, you can tell the difference usually between the bottom of a laguna and simply a hard clay layer. Hard clay layers are often indicative of a drying period. So the water dried out, um, even when it begins to get wet again and, um, and sediments accrue once again in that area, you just can't punch through that layer. And I took a core from another body of water in the valley, which is higher up by a, a small pond. And I also hit almost the, the, the same time period, about 81,000 hard clay sediments. So it would imply that Petapia, which is much smaller, um, around 81,000 or, or before, slightly before that, and the same thing for this other body of water. So both of those could also be um, proxy indicators for drought. Um, another problem I have with looking at pollen in Copan or in any area is that there aren't enough markers for exactly what pollen signatures, what type of environments they represent. So one project I've been doing um, for about five years now is putting out pollen collectors for one year, exactly one year. So I open them up and then I cap them on exactly a year later. And that's to look at, you know, to, to try and determine what I'm seeing in sediment cores. And so here's one that I left out on the top of the ball court at Copan. So for a whole year, tourists got this blue frisbee in their, in their photographs. Um, it is simply a Nalgene container. Um, you put a centimeter of glycerol, which is the sticky substance in the bottom of it. So anything that, that goes in there sticks in the bottom. And the frisbee actually breaks many whirlwinds up um, that, 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 that are created in the air. We don't see them, but they're all over the place. If you ever see leaves spinning on the ground, if you have a whirlwind like that, it goes over a plastic container like this, it'll, it can lift out all the pollen. So um, the frisbee will cut that. It'll basically break the whirlwind. Um, and, uh, and then after a year, I cap them off and analyze what kind of pollen's in them. That's, it's not enough to do that. I have to have someone who is a, a highly trained botanist also go to the same area and map the distribution of trees. When I put this collector out, the University of Atomna in Tegucigalpa had just come and surveyed the entire area of the principal group and documented what species were there. So um, they're gonna be working with me um, in the coming year in Copan to do this as well, and hopefully we're gonna do this in many different environments all over Honduras. And I also have several collectors out in Guatemala right now. The problem is people steal these. I write peligroso on them with skull and crossbones, and I put like pink fingernail polish and like highlight that. Um, not everybody can read. Uh, so um, it's, it's hard to find places where I can put them. And again, if anybody has a project here where they're interested in putting a couple out and they can vouch for them, you know, we can put them out. But um, hopefully, um, I don't, even over the next 10 years, I want to put these collectors in every different type of environmental zone so we can really understand what pollen tells us about areas and how representative it is of the environment because there's a lot of debates about this. And lastly, just to show you the two cores I'm working on, I cored these at the same time as Petapia, two, two other ponds, but I'm going back this summer with a, with a larger new piston core to get, um, to get samples that are fresh. This is a, an amazing, uh, rather small pond um, in Rio Amarillo, but it ha I extracted a sediment core that's almost 10,000 years old from this uh, body of water. That's because it has natural springs. It has two natural springs that feed it, so it's never dried out because of these two springs. 
And it is it's such a treasure. I'm so worried someone's going to decide to dredge it and use it as a fish pond, which is what seems to be the continual proposal for all of these bodies of water in Copan. And I was like, please don't do that. Um, but I at least want to get three more cores to save from it before something happens to it. Because, um, wow, 10,000 years of environmental history from Copan is just uh, an amazing thing to have. And this is the body of water that um, only has a post-classic date from St. Dave's Mill, but I am very interested in the post-classic. And this core has maize pollen in its earliest levels, possibly for a substantial period, I mean, possibly 100 years at least, if not more. Um, so we know that people were um, up there in the post-classic living around this body of water. That fits a pattern that we see in Copan, where people moved up to higher areas in the post-classic, probably because they no longer had a king um, and his soldiers to protect them. So they had to retreat to safer, um, safer places. Um, so, in closing, I'd just like to thank um, LOA for inviting me to speak and the University of Pennsylvania Museum, um, the Instituto Hondureño um, de Antropología y Historia, and um, FAMSI and Fulbright and Sigma Zai for supporting this research. Thank you.